of my cousins played guitar in a band. It was Paul Revere and the Raiders cover band. And I used to go to this roller rink with my cousins and he was playing guitar in it. And so he taught me the first few songs that I learned, Louie Louie, uh, Gloria. And then I just kind of took off from that. I was playing around a lot uh, in the Bay Area. Broadway, when it was all blues and jazz clubs, I was kind of just walking around up and down the streets with a guitar and going in every club and any club owner that would let me play because I was underage. They'd keep me in the basement, say you can come up and play, but then you gotta go back out the basement. Uh, don't drink any water, don't drink anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I started hanging out with Greg Raleigh a lot. I was like 14 and a half. I just felt like something was gonna happen. I was getting very close to all these guys. They were in the studio recording the Abraxas record. And they had set me up in a little office off the side of the room where I used to take like a twin and turn it face down and put a pillow over the back and crank it and just practice the records. At the end of about two months, I remember, you know, sitting down at the dinner table with my folks and I said, you know, I think I'm going to get in this band, Santana, I think they're going to ask me. And they both start hysterically laughing, going, I can't believe the confidence this kid has, you know, and I'm going, I don't know, I'm just telling you the truth. That's what I think is going to happen. And the next day, the Santana guys asked me to join. recording in Wally Hyder's with Santana. And we're in there late one night, and uh, Clapton walks through the door, you know? He came in, and it ended up being Eric and I playing guitar. We didn't say any two words to each other the whole night. We just played for like about an hour. And I'm sitting here going, I'm going, what, what just happened? That's insane, you know? Eric, you know, we, we were talking, and. He says, who are your influences? And I go, well, man, you're like one of them, the main ones. And he goes, I don't believe it. I picked up an acoustic guitar for him, and I played him pretty much note for note, Crossroads, Spoonful, and stuff like that that was off the Live's uh, Wheels of Fire record. Gave me a great compliment, and then he proceeded to ask me to move to England to join the band. And I was like, this is so crazy. So I said, you know, I, I don't know if I'm, I'd love to play with you, but I don't know if I'm, you know, ready to go to England. I go, you know, I'm actually still legally in high school. I have to get my parents permission to be able to go do anything, even if it's with Santana. So I said, I doubt I can do that, but I want to thank you for the offer, you know. got in the band, Carlos and I became like, we, we hung out all the time. Every once in a while, he would say, you know, I've got this melody and I want you to play a harmony to it, like on Jungle Strat or stuff like that. Uh, and he'd show me the part and then I'd, you know, play the harmony to it. But he wasn't telling me what to do. I was really kind of, I didn't even know how my style was going to fit in with the band. You know, it was so far removed from everything I'd been listening to with all, you know, the Latin and African percussion and, you know, I was not that strong of a rhythm guitar player back then. And, you know, they, they let me play a lot of lead. Carlos was very strong at both. And so if I was playing rhythm on stage when he was playing lead, I'd play very quietly. I just kind of, you know, chug along like an older jazz guy. The cool 
setup that I had back then was a Les Paul that I got. It was a 68 reissue gold top with the P90s and a Wawa and a twin. And then I put like the cheapest 12 inch eminent speakers I could find in it so they'd break up. And you just turn it up to 10 and that was it. It was a good combo, man. Some days if I practice and I'm practicing straight for like six hours, five hours, I'll play with eights on a Strat or a Tele and it feels great and I love it. I'll play nines mostly, but then other times I'll play tens. They all sound good to me. I think it's more between your fingers and the amplifier and the guitar and the myth about the big strings. I mean, yeah, for blues they sound gigantic, but if you try to play the other stuff all night long, like, I'm going to play what's comfortable to me, you know? Hendrix played eights and sevens, you know? So there's, it's a myth. It depends what you're doing, what you like. We tour 11 months out of the year. The 12th month we come out and we do uh, next, Journey Third record. And at this point, CBS is kind of giving us an ultimatum. Like, you guys need a front man. We need to get on the radio. Otherwise, you're going to be dropped. I didn't know how comfortable I would be trying to write a song for a vocalist. Never even thought of it, you know? It was always jam. We listened to our manager, Herbie Herbert, and he happened to be like 1,000% correct. In the end, Herbie sent Perry out on tour with us. I think we were in Denver, Colorado. We were hanging out in a hotel room. I mean, I had an acoustic guitar. I had some music that I'd written thinking about, okay, well, I'm supposed to construct, you know, a song here for him to sing. And I showed it to him and he started singing to it and it was immediate. It was just like it was done within an hour. And I thought it was pretty good, you know, at that point. And I started really hearing the texture of his voice and what he was capable of. And I loved that he had the R&B soul thing even though he was very clean in the first Journey record, the more we got into it, I realized he was a, you know, R&B guy. And so that's what I, f I felt like set us apart from many of the other rock bands that we got sort of shoved into, you know, a box with by critics at that point. Steve played drums. He was a drumming singer in his old band which really makes me understand why he had such great phrasing, you know, and knew how to sit in back of the beat and sing and make it soulful. But he also played bass. And I, I thought, wow, guy, you know, that's all you really need to be able to write a melody is your root note. And he came in and he showed me he had like a stumble of lights. But it was more like, it was like a... It was a stumble. You know, I listened to it and I said, what if, you know, like I put a little bit of a Jimmy in this. And we did like a stroll. He had the whole song pretty much written. I wrote the intro and a guitar bridge and a guitar solo. And bam, that was it. And we were off and running. You know, that was the second song. And then we realized that we actually did have chemistry together to write and continued doing that.
I had taken over Larry Graham's old place in Oakland. John came in, we set up his keyboards and we started writing. And we got into it immediately and wrote a skate record. I had like um, all the music for escape. You know, I had all the chords and the parts and pretty much arranged. I had Mother Father, the same, where I had arranged all the stuff, written one section with my father. And then we kind of banged out the rest of it. I had given Jonathan, I think, a box of cassettes. <laughs> you know, I never used to demo anything. I just like would turn on a cassette if I had an idea and I'd play the part and that was it. And I'd go back and listen to it and see if there was something there to finish writing this song with. And so that's what we did. We, we did through all that stuff. John did a lot of it and he went through it and he goes, you got these two parts. I think this part fits here. We just need to change the key of the other one. And he was very good at that. Before you knew it, we had a whole record that we rehearsed. I think we rehearsed for about a month straight, playing this stuff live, like we were gonna go play live. We never thought about a recording process. Uh, we're gonna cut it with drums and bass, then add this later. We just went in and played live. And so that's what that record is, and pretty much all our records. Everybody wants to hear the hits. I was maybe, not maybe, most definitely the guy that bucked it the most uh, for years and years and years. I wanted to move forward always, and I wanted to lay new stuff on it. And, you know, when we play by ourselves, you can do that, is what I found. You know, you can stretch out, you can add parts to songs, even if it's, you know, it, you're playing the hit, you can, you know, put different bits in for the song, just rearrange it a bit. So it's not the same all the time. It's what, mainly what the audience wants to hear. And they're the ones that are buying the tickets. And so you have to look at it from their perspective, you know, and give them what they want. Uh, and then you're gonna have a very successful tour. Uh -huh. 